Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 Tutorial 12b. This is the fourth tutorial in a series relating to accounting for capital or financing leases. This tutorial focuses on the second of two leasor tutorials. Specifically, this tutorial will focus on accounting for a direct financing lease for the leasor. This tutorial has four learning objectives. The first will be to review how to calculate the lease payments from the leasor perspective, which we've done before, and so we'll be able to satisfy this objective fairly quickly. The second will be to assess the relevant lease classification criteria for financing or capital leases from the leasor perspective under both IFRS and ASPE. The third objective will be to prepare the necessary journal entries to account for a direct financing or direct finance lease from the leasor perspective in situations of guaranteed or unguaranteed residuals and no transfer of ownership. And finally, to illustrate how to prepare a partial income statement, illustrating how a direct financing capital lease would be reported by the leasor. This tutorial is based on the Pebbles Company and Bam Bam Inc. C example. This follows the same example we've been using for tutorial 12A as well. So the first requirement will be to calculate the lease payment as determined by the leasor. So we'll illustrate very quickly and review because we've done this in all the previous tutorials to this point. The lease payment is always calculated by the leasor. And in our example, our payments are at the beginning of the period. So you have to make sure your calculator is in begin mode. We have a seven year lease. The leasor's rate is 10%. The present value of the asset is 500,000 and must be entered in your calculator as the opposite sign of the future value or any payment amount and the future value or the residual is $100,000. So if you compute the payment, you should get 83,784. The next requirement will be to evaluate the relevant leaseor criteria to classify the lease to BAM BAM under both ASPE and IFRS. Evaluating the lease criteria for the leaseor is the same under both ASPE and IFRS and use a classification basis approach. The first two criteria, the economic life and the economic value, are shared with the leasee perspective as well. Looking at the lease term of seven years over the economic life of the asset of nine years, 78% exceeds the ASPE benchmark of 75%, so we have a capital lease under ASPE just on this criteria alone. Again, remember that IFRS doesn't use the strict quantitative criteria, and so, but we can use the 75% as a guideline to determine significance. In terms of economic value, the present value of 500000 is the same as the fair value, so it's 100% and so satisfies ASPE's criteria very easily of the economic value being greater than 90%, so we have a capital lease for ASPE and a significant economic test. The residual is guaranteed or may not be guaranteed. Actually, we've got two scenarios, one where it's guaranteed and one where it's not, but the guaranteed residual piece is not necessary to itself determine whether or not the lease is a capital lease. The collectability is predictable. There are no cost uncertainties as indicated in the problem. And in this particular case, the fair value is uh, not greater than cost. And thus we have a direct financing lease. This is the piece that determines really whether or not you have a direct financing lease or a sales type lease. Our conclusion is that we have a capital lease for ASPE and a financing lease for IFRS. The third requirement then will be to look at preparing the journal entries for BAM BAM to account for the lease for 2020, 2021, and the settlement in 2027. And we'll show them under both scenarios where the residual is not guaranteed and where the residual is guaranteed. What we'll do is just start by showing what the amortization tables look like under both scenarios of unguaranteed and guaranteed residuals. And if you've already reviewed tutorial 12A, this will be very familiar to you. You have an initial balance of 500,000, which is the PV. And in the case of an unguaranteed residual, the only thing that's missing is a payment here, leaving an amount of 100,000 at the end. Whereas in the guaranteed residual scenario, we have a payment of 100,000, leaving us a balance of zero. But everything else is pretty much the same. Here we have 186,488 for expected interest, and you'll see how that's recorded in the next journal entry. To record the lease for the leaseor on January 1st, 2020, under direct financing lease, 
as with the previous sales type lease, we're going to debit the lease receivable for the same amount, 686487, which is the sum of all the payments, including the unguaranteed or guaranteed residual. It doesn't matter. It's included. This is the, the red line here. Or the red text is the piece that's different versus the sales type lease. What makes direct financing leases a little easier for students is that there's no revenue, there's no cost of goods sold, there's none of that we have to worry about. We don't have to deduct the guaranteed residual or anything. All we're doing here is basically crediting an equipment, you know, this could be equipment inventory or something, equipment acquired for a capital finance lease. Under a direct finance lease, the leaseor acts kind of as an intermediary where the leaseor will essentially purchase the equipment from the seller, in this case for $500,000, and then turns around and then leases it to Pebbles. So Bam Bam bought it from somebody and turns around and leases it to Pebbles. And the only profit that Bam Bam makes is the interest on the lease. So what's left over between the lease receivable and the fair value of the equipment that was purchased to be leased is simply unearned interest income or unearned interest revenue for $186,487. The lease receivable and the unearned interest income accounts both exist and for the same amounts in the sales type lease, except what's also included there are sales revenue, cost of goods sold, and inventory. It's the same journal entry at inception for both guaranteed and unguaranteed residuals. So the nice thing for students is that it doesn't matter if your residual is guaranteed or if it's unguaranteed. The journal entry is the same for both. And then after that, the journal entries are all the same as they were for sales type lease. So if you haven't previewed tutorial 12A, I'll just go over these journal entries briefly. The next entry also at January 1st, 2020, would be to record the initial payment due on inception of the lease from Pebbles. Pebbles pays cash of 83784 and that's credited right against the lease receivable. And then at the end of the year, we have an interest accrual. So the company will debit unearned interest revenue or income and credit interest income for the interest that's earned. So the 500,000 initial PV that was set up minus the first payment that's attributed 100% to principal times the 10% interest gives us 41,622. And again, these are the same entries, whether or not it's a sales type lease and whether or not it is guaranteed or unguaranteed residuals. Now we'll continue to the years 2021, where once again on January 1st, cash lease receivable for the amount of the payment, no problem. We continue to record earned interest income on the financing lease. So we're going to debit unearned interest income and credit interest income for 37405 this calculation shows, of course, the original 500000 minus the first payment. And then this piece here, I'm just going to put this in brackets, this 41,622 minus this 83,784. The difference between the two, of course, is the amortization, right? If the 41,622 is the interest expense and the payment is 83,784, the difference between those two is how much is amortized against the lease amortization schedule. And if you're not understanding that, then you should go back and just review the lease amortization schedule to see, to confirm what this is. And then, of course, multiply by 10% and you'll see 37,405, which exists on the amortization schedules. And then we can proceed all the way down to 2026, where just prior to settlement, settlement on January 1st, 2027, we have the last journal entry to record the interest income. So crediting interest income and debiting the unearned interest income or revenue for the 9,093. That is the remaining amount on the amortization schedule. Again, these entries are the same regardless of whether it's a sales type lease and regardless of whether the residual is guaranteed or unguaranteed. The only piece that's different are the journal entries that appear at settlement. These two entries at the bottom here are the same as a sales type lease scenario. So the only difference in the sales type lease is actually at inception. The rest is the same. Bam Bam is taking back ownership of leased equipment that has a fair value now of 85000 The expected residual was 100000 Bam Bam is going to debit equipment inventory for 85000 It's getting the equipment back. It's going to credit the balance in the lease receivable for 100000 and because the actual value of the equipment is less than the 100000 and the residual is unguaranteed, the leaseor takes the risk. So the leaseor must then take a loss, so it'll debit the loss on the lease for the difference of 15000 In the case of the guaranteed residual, 
the company will still debit the leased equipment for 85000 It will still credit the lease receivable for 100000 But because the residual is guaranteed, Pebbles actually has to pay the difference. So Pebbles pays 15000 to Bam Bam, and that's why we have a debit to cash. So that's the only difference between the entries at settlement, and they're the same as they were under sales type lease. The final requirement here is to record a partial income statement for Bam Bam for the year ended December 31st, 2020. So that's what we'll do. And we'll show it both guaranteed and unguaranteed. So here it is, big splash, direct financing with an unguaranteed residual and direct financing lease income statement with a guaranteed residual. They're exactly the same. You'll notice that there is no sales revenue. There's no cost of goods sold and there's no gross profit. Those only occur under a sales type lease. So basically, all we're doing is reporting as other revenue, the interest income that the leaseor has earned on leasing the equipment for the leasee. So that's pretty much all there is to it. So again, the income statements are both the same under both scenarios of unguaranteed and guaranteed residual scenarios. Now let's just go over with some key points to remember. First, payments are determined by the leaseor and always include the residual guaranteed or not using the leaseor's rate. Be careful, most leases have payments at the beginning of the period, so make sure you set your calculator to begin mode. Uh, always read the data carefully to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to. If the lease payments are at the end of the period, you do not want to have your calculator in begin mode. Next, the lease criteria for the leaseor basically include the economic life criteria and the economic value as we saw for the leasee. So the same 75% for the economic life and 90% for the economic value are benchmarks for ASPE, and we can use those same benchmarks for IFRS to determine significance. The additional criteria for the leaseor however, include these items here. So whether or not the residual is guaranteed, if collectability is predictable, that there are no cost uncertainties, and that the fair value is greater than the cost, right? And this will determine the type of lease. If the fair value is greater than cost, remember we have a sales type lease. If the fair value is equal to cost, then we have a direct financing lease. If the fair value is greater than its cost, then we would have a sales type lease. And with direct financing leases, we do not have any credits to sales revenue or no debits to cost of goods sold or inventory. The differences in accounting for unguaranteed versus guaranteed residuals for direct financing leases are at settlement because it's the same entry at inception. It's the same set of entries throughout the lease. And the only thing to worry about is whether or not cash is paid by the leasee or whether or not the leaseor takes a loss. So the only difference is at settlement. At settlement, we look to see whether or not the fair value of the equipment or the appraised value at the time the lease is up is less than the residual. In our example here it was, recall that the fair value was $85,000 and the expected residual was $100,000. So in the case of the unguaranteed residual, the leaseor reported a loss, so debited a loss of the difference between the two or 15000 in the case of a guaranteed residual, the leaseor does not take on any risks, so the leasee has to pay the leaseor the difference, and so that means a cash amount debited instead of a loss by the leaseor. And finally, the leaseor does not record any depreciation of the leased asset. It's the leasee that records depreciation. This concludes tutorial 12b. If you want to review once again, or if you have not yet reviewed accounting by the leaseor for sales type leases, then you'll want to review tutorial 12a.